I'm in the saddle. Yes, I love an early morning ride. Oh, I'm an early riser myself. Come along, Tibbet. Stop wheezing. <sighs> well, let's stand there panting, Tibbet. Start the unpacking. Here, let me help. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. The reception is at six. Thank you, my dear. Oh, Tibbet, you heard what Miss Jennifer said. There is a reception at six. Yes, sir. So I shall be needing a white jacket and a black tie. Yes, sir. And if possible, a clean shirt. Yes, sir. Oh, my Lord, Tibbet. Look at the state of my clothes. How on earth do you pack my bags? Sorry, sir. Well done, my good man. Do we have to keep this up when we're alone? Well, successful cover becomes almost second nature. What's all this business about Pegasus disappearing? One minute he's in his stall, the next night a hide and a hair of him. We should look into it. Well, don't you concern yourself with that. There's the man I saw at the Pegasus stable. Another wealthy owner? Who knows? But she'd certainly bear closer inspection. We're on a mission. It's a contrary. On a mission, I am expected to sacrifice myself. Without giving away the best surprises, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you fit in? Well, I believe that part was originally uh, written as a jockey. And uh, my dad was really quite a famous racehorse trainer. His name was Shrimp McNee, believe it or not. He's about the height of this table. And I met uh, Cubby Broccoli at the Del Mar races in uh, California, where they have a song uh, by Bing Crosby to start the day. And he looked at me and I looked at him. And uh, <laughs> we'd never met, but we knew each other largely from the fact that he'd filched on a Blackman office and put her in Goldfinger at very short notice, I may say, which made us Avengers people very unhappy because we were about to go on to film, which was a great treat in those days from tape, and we had hoped Donna Blackman was coming with us. Not so. Cubby Broccoli put out his thing, fished her away, and she was gone, so we got Diana Rigg. But I think he must have thought race course, his father was a trainer, maybe. Anyway, eventually it worked out, and partly through my dear friend Roger Moore, I ended up playing Sir Geoffrey Tebbit. So how he got well, all the way from a jockey to Sir Geoffrey, and a really a perfectly delightful and very funny part, uh, was done largely, I think, through the good offices of Cabby Broccoli and Roger Moore. Yes. I'll tell you, the Bond people are famous for, and it comes from Broccoli, I think, of being, yes, about the most delightful group of people to work with, certainly in my lifetime. Because to a limited extent, your career has had similarities with that of Roger Moore. I mean, you both became household names as a result of starring in television series, which resulted in both of you, to an extent, being typecast from then on as imperturbable English gentlemen, ready with um, a quick word as well as a quick decision. James Bond and John Steed of the Avengers also have quite a bit in common. I mean, did you ever have any interest in playing Bond yourself? Um, Chris Plummer always said that I should have done. One, I was far too old. Two, I didn't have any interest. Three, I didn't know who he was. Four, I hate those sort of books and would never read them. Uh, five, Sean Connery was just stupendous in the part. And Roger, of course, is one of the best comedians, wits, and has put his own stamp completely on the part. I wouldn't even dream of even having been thought uh, for it. On the other hand, Kingsley Amos, who's written a thing on Bond, uh, spoke about the Steed character in television and said that he was the first of his type. And one did gather a sort of mystique, which I think is it's like the Emperor's clothes. It's so ludicrous. You think up a character in 1960, literally out of your head through panic, because the producer's saying, for goodness sake, be more interesting. And it turns into something that people see over a 25-year period. It happened to coincide with the beginning of commercial television. It happened to coincide when people all watched television or were locked into television. I was extremely lucky. So the characters now got to the point where they're going to make a film of the Avengers, and they still want me to do it. And I said to the people who are going to do it yesterday, well, I've got to rethink the character. I mean, I can't be what people remember of Steed. I have to be the... Because I thought it out 20 years ago. I now have to think out the man, if you're going to do it again, now... 
which I think is the most extraordinary thing about television. You can be Dixon of Doc Green till you're 80 and still on the beat, and dear old Jack Warner did just that. So I find, and hopefully have a sense of humour about it, and I'm delighted that people want me to be in these things. And yes, I think they become sort of cult creatures. I first met Roger Moore in a gym behind Cambridge Circus when we were all working out trying to develop our bodies. That was in 1948. Did you all succeed? Well, we got them a little better than they were, I think. But um, <laughs> then we met again in the early days of when we were at Elstree. And in fact, at Elstree, they were extremely pompous. They used to ask the Avengers on a very back lot there where every time an aeroplane went over, we had to stop shooting. And he was on some other one. He kept saying, oh, when features come in, you know, you'll have to move out. For four years, the Saint and the Avengers kept the English film industry alive. We're very proud of it. Well, let us, for the moment, go back to... Patrick Lee, when he was small. We, I believe your first experience of treading the boards was at prep school at the age of eight, playing Henry V. Do you know... Abridged version, surely. No, you, it's interesting you say that, because I would have said that, too. But my dear friend, six-foot-four friend, Christopher Lee, uh, who was in that production, played Mowbray, swore to me only the other day... He also revealed some other very interesting things about his character. I didn't realise that he did very secret intelligence work during the war. He's a very brave man. But he said to me, yes, Patrick, you played Henry V uncut. So I'm now, at the age of eight, I hasten to add. So I go around and I say, oh, yes, I played Shakespeare's Henry V uncut. And it's the same way you say, well, I was a captain of my ship in 1940. What do you mean a captain of your ship? How old were you? Well, I was 19. Well, how could you be captain of your ship? Well, it was a very small ship. It was. It was a motor torpedo boat, 71 foot six. Did this, I mean, we, we, most of us are in school plays, sure. but we don't all become actors. But no. did this set your feet on the path? Well, you know, I don't think it's that. I subscribe to the view that Glenda Jackson gives, that broken homes provide more actors, in fact, most creative artists. And I think when you're shoved about from pillar to post and put out here and put out there, or sent abroad or denied access to one's parental love, uh, you have to use it in other ways. And um, that's very much a case with me. And it was fully developed not only at Summerfields, my prep school, but at Eton. And they were very creative people. Uh, and they encouraged us into this area. And apart from running a very successful betting shop at Eton, which I eventually got sacked, um, I really was into the arts in a big way. <laughs> you throw that away. I mean, now that is perfect timing. I mean, that's proper John Steed timing. You ran a betting shop and got sacked. Yes, and flogged. But not necessarily in that order. But um, I'm very successful until I finally lost it all at Ascot and it was disaster. <laughs> I think perhaps I won't ask you any more about that. <laughs> that's we might no, be that's a very subterranean area, I can tell you. <laughs> well, now, you started... I can name names, but I won't. Right, on you go. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you went to drama school with the Douglas... Yeah, for a very short time, for nine months, and learnt absolutely nothing, not even how to um, cope with my diaphragm. Then, as it was the very beginning of the war, I answered an advertisement and went into a rep at Letchworth Garden City, a very chaste uh, area for a repertory, and I stayed there. And then I was an understudy, general understudy, with Vivian Lee in The Doctor's Dilemma at the Haymarket Theatre, and I came in because poor Cyril Cusack had an accident on St. Patrick's Day and fell down at Vivian Lee's feet and was fired and Peter Glenville was brought in and I was his understudy. And then, this is 1942, and then I was called up for the Navy and uh, the understudy to go from me was beaten up by a gang of thugs in the Haymarket and Sir John Gielgud played the part better than anybody at 48 hours notice. But uh, then I was five years in the Navy and then I came back again. Well, that's sort of a lifetime encapsulated in a few words and it all sounds absolutely marvellous. Years ago, right. It's another world. Does it feel like another world? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So does the war, thank goodness. Do you think back to those days very much? Very, very little. But, uh, no, whole other life. I thought my life was ruined at the age of uh, 20 when I went in the Navy, when all the others, Michael Redgrave, James Mason, Dennis Price, Stuart Granger, were all becoming movie stars. The first test I did for a movie, um, I couldn't do it because I went in the Navy, and Stuart Granger played the part, Thursday's Child. Oh, I was a great star monkey. And most miserable, and I crept back in 1946 when I came out of the Navy, started all over again through the good offices of Tenants and Kitty Black, and worked my way through and up and back, and then finally got a family, couldn't support them, emigrated to Canada, assisted passage, 1952, and became a star of Canadian television, 
But that was useless because there were only 80 sets in the whole continent, so nobody knew that I was a star of television alongside Christopher Plummer, Kate Reed, many other eminent Can Donald Sutherland Canadian actors. But well, I was always in the forefront of things, way before anybody cared. Mm, mm. I, I, I went through a whole list of uh, films that you were in in right. sort of ten years from when you came out of the army, um, <laughs> and none of my reference books mention you as being sort of in well, it. You know, I'll tell you who did, though. Cary Grant. I received a prize for doing Sleuth. It was the, it's called the uh, Straw Hat Award, which is a particularly obscene award for travelling all around the United States in some play, which you do quite well. Anyway, I won this award, and it was presented at Jimmy's Restaurant in New York by Cary Grant, no less, in 1975. I took Di Rig. I was terribly proud. And he introduced me, because he has a great sense of humour. He got a thing like you've got, a biography of what one had done, which I may say includes being an extra in Hamlet. Uh, it goes on for all sorts of things. He read it out as though I'd played a leading part. Starred with Laurence Olivier in Hamlet, starred with his cousin David Niven in remake of The Scarlet Pimpernel, which I did. I was just one of the horsemen. Do you know, I had to go up afterwards. And Eileen Hurley was there, who also won an award, who played the Gertrude in Hamlet. And all these eminent people. And this great man had made me, by giving... All he had to do was read my biography, but pretend I'd starred in all these things, which, as you say, had a very peripheral effect upon. It was the most embarrassing time I've ever had, because I had to refute all this, <laughs> which was also funny. Now, it's 57, was it, that you went to Hollywood and appeared in, and got named in, the MGM musical Les Girls? That's right. You're just too charming, you're just too great. You're just too perfect, you're just too voice great. To win you, dear heart, is all I wish. We'll take your Casanova, cause you're just my dish. You're just too luscious, too very, very sweet. Ooh, you're just too sexy when you toil on that heat. So it's no wonder I love you as I do. For I've got to say in every way you're just too, too. Now, how did the musical come about? I mean, uh, I believe also Leslie Phillips was in it. That's right, yes. It, um, um, I, in fact, read for a part in that that Leslie Phillips eventually played. And I was living practically as a sort of uh, derelict on Hollywood Boulevard in one of those uh, hotels, about $15 a week. And I really was very, very depressed and very broke. And I had to go to a room at MGM and read with Kay Kendall, who'd just finished Bell, Book and Candle with Rex Harrison, had the most beautiful mink coat and everything, and George Cuco was there. And I was sort of practically smelling, I was so awful. And I had to read this very sophisticated scene from Bell, Book and Candle, which I did so badly and could have done so well if I'd had the confidence. Leslie Phillips got it, which infuriated me. And they gave me this other part uh, of a, well, whatever it was, a prosecuting counsel or something. I had rather good billing, but anyway, I was in it. Did it have any lasting effect on your career to be in something of that size? Yes, after? because strangely enough, James Mason was doing a very big television show and there was one other partner, there were only two people in it. Well, there was a woman, Faith Demerg, and James, and eventually myself. And I was suggested for it by the same agent, and I turned up, he said, but you're not the man, I thought. He wanted Leslie Phillips. He said, that man in Lay Girls. And so uh, something had happened, and I was there by mistake. Can you imagine starting a part with James Mason, directed by Lewis Milestone, who directed all... Who am I telling? You know more about movies than I do. And being the wrong person. Thank God I was quite good in it. But, uh, yes, it had a direct result in that respect. Do you think that was the start of things? Oh, in Hollywood? Well... Oh, the start big of everything. Time, shall we oh, say. Big no, time. no, no, no. I was... I've been big time in my own estimation since I was 17. Of Each little... Uh, yes. But you mean in terms of what might be looked on as success in public terms? Mm. Um, oh, no, I didn't make any success until The Avengers in 1960. I was walking down Piccadilly, and an ex-producer from Hollywood said, you're my producer. I said, of what? He said, I'm making a Western. I said, well, what's it about? He said, it's about Sir Winston Churchill. I said, what? <laughs> in fact, he had got the war books of uh, Sir Winston, and he was making them into a series, which turned out to be The Valiant Years. I was the associate producer. We had Richard Burton narrating it and John Schlesinger directing it. I was enormously proud of it, and I was a producer. And one day, Sidney Newman, who was the head of ABC at that time, he was later the head of the BBC drama, and he said, do you want to be in a series over Christmas? I said, well, what is it? I don't think so. I'm a producer now, you know. And I was frightfully proud of myself, earning 50 pounds a week. So he said, it's called The Avengers. I said, I don't know, I might. I'll do it for 300 pounds a week. He said, what? 
You don't get that sort of money. Anyway, they gave me £150 a week, which was twice as much as they intended, because they thought it was for a fortnight, for an episode, you see. So, because I was so confident, because I was a producer, I got this marvellous part in this television series, which I thought was just over Christmas for three months. And nine years later, I was still doing it. So, yes, I've called that success. It wasn't quite the same, was it, when it started? It was you and... Ian Henry. Henry. Now, God bless him, dead. And uh, then the sort of switch of bringing in Honor Blackman. Well, it was all done by expediency, which, of course, a great deal of our business, Mm. as you well know, is uh, the reason for most things, for quite a lot of the things. Um, In the first place, Ian left. Ian was a very, very brilliant man, and he burned himself out in a way. But he then became a movie star, and we were left with a gap and about ten scripts written for Ian Henry. And uh, Sidney, who was a wonderful maverick, said have it as a woman. We'll have it a mixture of Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, and Margaret Bork-White, the photographer on Life magazine. That's what we'll have. But he hadn't got the money to change the script, so we thought of different girls and uh, Nari Dawn Porter and, uh, oh, lovely, lovely actresses. And then finally got on a Blackman. But she had to do the scripts that had been written for Ian Henry, so she got the idea of playing it very much as a sort of an aggressive person and so it arose out of that it all arose out of expediency then honor left and suddenly we went on to film and we did tests and got die rig and she brought her own inimitable i'm going to cavalcade with her soon and we'll be and you know and her cleopatra and everything at churches she's a great great actress so i think those chance things brought it as a show which had an impact because of those sort of things then it sort of fell off later on chance is um very important isn't it don't you think so Mm. oh while you were doing the Avengers, also working in the theatre and going no. to the States. It's interesting you say that. Towards the end, I was offered Girl in My Soup, Not Now, Darling, various plays. And I got into a sort of, I think you do in television, you get so into the it was awful hours. And I didn't think I could, and I should have done. Then I made a dreadful mistake in 69, when really I was doing pretty well here. I went back to California again, where I've been ever since which in terms of life was good, because my daughter's an asthmatic and it helps her out there, but in terms of career, I should have stayed here. I'm now a sort of, you know, I'm a journeyman actor. I could have been much, much bigger, much more success. I could have played sleuth in London. I could have done many things. I don't regret them, but I would have been much more successful. You use the word success. So I would say I was successful in the 60s, and I've gone down ever since. But strange enough, I'm pretty happy. Now, you've been doing, to some extent... What I think is a marvellous idea, the sort of cameo appearances here mm-hmm. and there, different things, which, you know, you can go into sort of fun films then without minding that they are yes. only trivial films. There was, for instance, a sort of poor man's American version of Carry On Doctor called Young Doctors in Love. Oh, that's awful. Do you know, in that, I did a week's work on that. I was in Australia doing a mammoth miniseries, which you will see this month uh, for the term is Natural Life in Australia. It's on the BBC. Um, and they said, oh, he's got a week off. If you star him, he'll be in it. I ended up with one line, which I'm not going to say what it is, because I don't think you can say it on the air. And it is so embarrassing. Very funny film, though. Are you a waitress? No, I'm a prostitute. I just wore these to turn on the guys. How far along is she? Well, she doesn't know exactly, but she's huge. All right, young lady. You'll have a beautiful baby in no time. I don't think so, doctor. What? What are you talking about? Hysterical pregnancy. She wants the straight life so badly that she's convinced herself she's pregnant. Doctor, this girl is in heavy labor. It's just not so, doctor. Thank you, doctor. What happened? Was that a balloon? Next. Poor kid. I never knew it was possible for a medical doctor to be so unfeeling. Sounds to me like you're falling in love with him. I'm glad he didn't say the line that I'd thought of there, but yes, anyway, <laughs> no, we'll we pass that one that over. One. Um, one that I thought was great fun, perhaps it wasn't such fun to you, but that was The Howling. Yes. Splendid movie, all of you, I think you included, turned into werewolves. That's right. I didn't even know what a werewolf was, and I went into a shop and said, I want to know something about werewolves. They said, we've just got a book in called Werewolf, which was very handy to me, <laughs> as you know. Yes, it was directed by Joe Dante, who did Gremlins, as you know, the following year. Yes. Yeah, I thought The Howling was very good, didn't you? I mean, in that sort of feel, Mm. it had a sense of humour. It was quite extraordinary. They did no camera tricks. All that was done by young Rob Bottin. And that big love scene in the Redwoods there by those two kids when turning into ten-foot werewolves was done literally by putting makeup on step by step. And it was quite incredible. It was a very good film. I do agree with you. And what else have you done? 
that we can be seeing? Well, you see, I could run through some titles which I hoped would never see the light of day, but due to cable do, and they range from Sweet Sixteen, The Creature Wasn't Nice, Hot Touch, directed by Roger Vadim, his last film, about, uh, actually rather good, about art forgery. Uh, and finally, uh, this is Spinal Tap. Have you seen that one? Oh, yes, yes, I enjoyed that. It was great fun. Directed by Carl Reiner's son, Rob Reiner, and for which I was paid an extraordinary small uh, fee, but the promise of quite large points. So, yes, I've been very lucky in being in these strange, interesting, progressive films, and I have a sneaking feeling it is because I come cheap. No, I make money on commercials, so I like to act for the pleasure of it and not for the money. Well, that's what I feel. I mean, you're keeping very much up to date, the awful phrase, with it, aren't you? I mean, who knows, any moment you could be in something that would really be, you know, the greatest film since sliced bread. <laughs> I love the way you put it. Well, I shall hold on to that and keep my fingers crossed. And what is this about... Um, continue with the Avengers. Is it another series or is it a film? Well, somebody came out, they were going to do another uh, series, I think, with two younger people, you know, and with myself as sort of elder statesman. And I think then I want to do a film of it, yes, and I think they probably will. People love serials. They love to wonder what's going to happen next. I noticed even on Wallenberg, they had to finish it with what will happen to him next and all that. I think people are fascinated. And if you have the good fortune to remain alive and survive to a point where they can still use you, at least this is my theory, people seem to be interested. It's like wanting to know the end of a story, what happened to him at the end of all that. Well, we want to thank you very much for coming and joining us and being so frank and so lovely. Oh, bless you. And we will play you out with the music that I suppose whatever you do will always be associated with you. Well, that's it for tonight. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Patrick McNee. I know I did. What a marvellous raconteur he is. I hope, too, that you'll join us for our next edition when John Benson supplies the nostalgia with part three of his musical salute to lyricist Paul Francis Webster. And Philip Bergson talks to Richard Donner, who directed Man, The Omen, and whose latest fantasy, Lady Hawk, is all ready for release. So, till Thursday, then, on behalf of technical assistant Ron Mitchell and producer Lynn Fairhurst, this is Nick Jackson saying thanks for listening, and for now, goodbye.